under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Since it's just get your life forward, that's where it's going. Okay, I want to welcome everybody, but I want a special welcome to Susan St. Angela. Please, she's coming, she's our author, she's our speaker today. Give her a big welcome. She has books up there that she will be selling. I'm going to put her in the, uh, in the line first. So anybody that wants to come and buy books, we can get books. And then she'll be speaking around 1 o'clock. Okay. Uh, guests. You notice that we have little stickers on our name tags for our guests. And the yellow, the yellow ones are for our guests. And Sandy Goffrey, can you stand up? Can you welcome our guest? Where are you going, Sandy? Good to see you. Okay, and then we have Annette Lombardi. I have to move that far. I'm right here. Okay. All right. <laughs> and where are you from? I live in Virginia. Oh, man. Virginia, Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. Where are Connecticut? Oh, I live in Southern Connecticut. I live in Southern Connecticut. Well, welcome to the Cape. Okay. And then we have new members. Meryl. Where is Meryl? Meryl, Meryl Baker, okay. Here's our new member here. Okay, Meryl, where are you from? <laughs> Southport in Mass. We have a lot of Southporters here. All right, welcome, okay. Okay, then we have uh, Susan. Where is Susan Fairley? Susan Fairley? Susan, Susan. Oh, okay. What? Did somebody raise her hand? All of the 
table for icebreaker. These are all packed. So thank you very much. And Facebook. Well, uh, we do have a Facebook site for our new members. It's uh, Mashpee Women's Club on Facebook, and you can follow us, and we post pictures of all our events as much as we can on there. Uh, we got some beautiful pictures of last month's fashion show, so check it out. And uh, join us. The more people who join us, the better off we are. And look at the lovely centerpieces. I want to thank Catherine and Norma Jean. Raise your hand, Catherine. Schwartz and Norma Jean. Very much for these lovely centerpieces. Okay. Uh, membership. Do you want to say anything, Mary Liz? starts September 1st. So dues are now due. $35. Um, we will help you to make sure that you pay. You can, you can find me today and give me a check. You can send Venmo and Catherine will get me the list. And what we pay for our luncheon just covers our lunch. It doesn't cover any programs. It doesn't cover the rental of anything. It doesn't cover our centerpieces. That all comes out of our dues. So we really um, appreciate you supporting our organization. And we are now 280 members strong, highest than ever before. And then just a couple of things, I keep announcing this, but November and December are moved because of the holiday season. So November Boutique will be November, be Thursday, Thursday the 16th, all at New Seabury Country Club. And the December luncheon will be Thursday, December 14th. So November 16th and December 14th, all on a Thursday. And next month, our, we're back at the New Seabury Country Club. We're having Margot Shield. She's an aerial photographer. It's supposed to be spectacular um, views and stuff, so please. And then September, we're going to be having the, the Cranberry Guy, which should be very interesting about Cranberry on okay. cake. Uh, please see your flyers for any information. We, Cindy, Cindy uh, Collins is not here, but she, I don't know. Those who, raise your hand if you were signed up for the golf tournament. We didn't have it because of rain, but, but it was spectacular. She did a great job. We just played games, and she did a lot of work, but we didn't get to play. But, 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 the, but the club was fabulous. They gave us a gift, you know, a rain check so we can still play. So it was a win-win situation. We had lunch and we had a wonderful time. Uh, and also, if you need a get well card or if you know somebody that needs a little cheering up, make sure you send it to Elizabeth, you know, the birthday girl, because <laughs> it's, it's really important, it's nice, because, you know, charity starts at home and we need to make sure we take care of each other as well as everybody else. So please let us know, because we really want to help you. And I'm gonna let, and Barbara, where are you? Okay, Barbara has something on fundraising, and then we'll eat, and then Carolyn will introduce Susan when she's ready to speak, and Norma Jean will pull the numbers for you. Thank you. Oh, good. Hi, um, I'm Barbara Marcio, and yes, I am the fundraising chair, and I'm so delighted to announce something that the Mashpee Women's Club is going to do for the first time. It's actually going to be in 2024, but we want to start to get the word out. Um, we're going to be doing a trip, and by a trip, I mean to Italy <laughs> for eight days, seven nights, and it's called Tuscan Treasures Cinque Terre, I think that's the right way to say, which is not in Tuscan. So I'm just letting you know right now that the official launch and details will be forthcoming in the next month or two. And actually, it's after the September luncheon, there's going to be an informational meeting about it. So it's September 2024. I think the dates are the 21st through the 29th. And I just want to put the word out there that and something interesting that I think is very appealing about it is that you're going to be at one central hotel and then be doing trips to all these various locations throughout 
Tuscany. And there's going to be dinners at wineries and vineyards. And it's going to be a fabulous itinerary. So look for more information. There will be an official launch in the next month by September. There's going to be an informational meeting. The final pricing is not going to be available for the air component of the trip until November. It's, it's not available to 300 days before, but we're going to have all the de other details about the trip. So put the word out. It's going to be open up first to Mashpee Women's Club members. And again, if you're bringing somebody you know, that you're going to room with, um, your guests in that capacity. But um, just wanted to get the word out. So more to come. Thank you, Barbara. OK, and then Pat reminded me, please, that on your tables is an icebreaker you could be doing during lunch. I want everyone to enjoy. And I think I'll start with this table here that they can go up, plus Susan. Blogger and Katie Pye. Her Baby Boomer series touches on many of the issues facing baby boomer women, but with a lighthearted, often humorous touch. This mystery series focuses on the adventures of Carol and Jim Andrews as they navigate their way along life's highway toward their twilight years, with one dead body thrown in just to keep things interesting. You are going to love listening to her. Also, I'd like to remind you that her books will be for sale after this presentation. So please sit back. I'm glad you have your ice cream and relax and enjoy this wonderful speaker. Big deal out of this, but what the heck? I'm coming, I'm coming. I should have been up here when you were talking. I don't know. I need to put my water somewhere. Right here or underneath? Under here. Yeah. Okay. Can you give me a signal if you need anything? I'm going to just do it right there. Thank you, Susan. Hello, all. Hello. I like that. Let me try that again. Hello, all. Hello. Woo! I want to see a hands of people from Connecticut. I heard some Connecticut people over there. Oh, you. Where are you from? Okay. Fairfield County. Anybody else? Yes? Okay, okay. I was born in West Hartford, and my books, excuse me, you did not raise your hand for Connecticut. You did? What year were you? Tell me later. Oh, because I went to the Mount. Oh, excuse me, we have to talk. I actually, saw, never mind. Um, I moved to New York, and then I moved to New Jersey when I married my husband, and I finally came back to New England, thank you, God. <laughs> yes. Um, I did have a very colorful life, most of which I will not bore you with, but my next question to all of you is, who read Nancy Drew when they were... Yes, this is my crowd, this is my crowd. Um, I always thought that Nancy was what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to have a a little snappy blue roadster that I would be bopping around town, and I, I always was envious of her kindly father, the judge. Do you know I'm being attacked by this flag? Is everybody noticing this? I, I hope that's getting on TV, because that's going to be an interesting idea. Anyway, um, and I, I was introduced by mysteries. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a little bit more. That's fine. Thank you. Oh, oh. I'll pick it up. Okay. Um, I always read mysteries, and I always wanted to write a mystery. I've been writing all my life, as you heard, but I had never written fiction before. And um, about 15 years ago, now you've, read, you've heard that I've survived cancer. I've survived cancer twice, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. I don't recommend it, but I'm here. So mammograms save lives. Um, my husband, we are now married 56 years. We were married on April Fool's Day. <laughs> this is true, because in those days, back in the last century, Catholics could not be married during Lent in church. So 
April 1st was the first Saturday after Easter, so that's why we're married on April Fool's Day. And little did I know that the joke was on me. <laughs> anyway, I was living on Cape Cod. We had two houses. We had a house in Connecticut and a house on Cape Cod. And I was spending a lot of time on Cape Cod because I was volunteering at the hospital thrift shop. I had a nice little group of girlfriends who would go out to lunch with me. We'd have a great time. We'd go shopping. And my husband was in Connecticut working in, to pay the mortgage, because isn't that what they're supposed to do? And one day, and then he would come up for weekends and then go back, and then I would have three days, and then he would come back, and it was working out beautifully from my point of view. And then one day, he announced that he was going to retire. And it was like being struck by lightning. I thought, oh my God, he's going to be here all the time. Let's sell the house and let's move to the Cape. And I thought, well, that's fine, but what are you going to do? <laughs> so I had this great idea. My husband was also a newspaper reporter at one time. And I had this great idea that he doesn't play golf, he doesn't play tennis. This was long before pickleball came into, into vogue. And I thought, well, let's write a book together. Because, you know, he writes, I write. And he thought that was a great idea. So he said, well, what shall we write? And I, of course, had in mind a mystery. And I already had the title in mind, which was Visual Aid, Retirement Can Be Murder. <laughs> um, and he said to me, he was envisioning some sort of political commentary essays, and I'm thinking, oh, boring. Um, I wanted to write a mystery. And he said, well, I've never read a mystery. And I said, and this was the stupidest thing almost I've ever said, I said, well, how hard could it be? You have a few suspects, you, you bump somebody off, you plant a few clues, and then you solve the mystery. That's, that's, you know, it's no big deal. And he said, well, I'm not so sure it's that easy. My original idea was to start, was to write a book from both the husband's and the wife's point of view, where the first chapter would be from the wife's point of view, certainly. It's my idea, I'm going to start it. And then he would write the second chapter, and it would be back and forth between a husband and a wife, exchanging ideas on how to solve this mystery. And oh, he thought that was a great idea. Now remember, this is 16 years ago. So he said, you write the first chapter, and I'll look at it, and I'll see where you're going, and then I'll write the second chapter. I said, fine. So I wrote the first chapter, and then he looked at it, he said, okay, fine. He said, give me some time. He said, I'll, I'll get back to you. Meanwhile, you know, keep going. So I wrote chapter three, because I was doing the odd chapters. Left up, you know, big hole for chapter two. Figuring I would piece it together later. And I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, fine. He said, I'm doing something with the, with the office now, the man's office. I said, well, you know, if the guy's retired, he's probably not going into work anymore. You know, because that's the whole point of being retired. You don't go into your office anymore, right? And um, he said, no, no, I'm on it, I'm on it. Then I was on chapter five, and I finally said to him, could I finally see what you've, what you've written? And he finally told me the truth, which was, this is not my thing. However, <laughs> and I truthfully have not done anything. However, I would be happy to have you write the book, and then I will critique the book. <laughs> now, I had been married for well over 40 years at that point, and I felt I had had just about enough critiquing from my husband <laughs> as I, was, I needed, really. I see a lot of people nodding their heads for some reason. I don't quite understand that. Anyway, so I wrote this book called Retirement Can Be Murder, and I did not anticipate that I would be killing people for the next 16 years of my life, but that's the way it, it sort of turned out. Um, the basic plot of all of this in this series is a husband and a wife, of a certain age. The wife is the smart one. I mean, you know, come on. And um, in the first book, the husband wants to retire, and the wife does not want him home. I don't know where I came up with this idea, it just came to me. And in the very first book, um, the husband discovers a dead body, the dead body of his retirement coach, actually. And of course, who has to help si save him? but the smart wife. So there began uh, the Baby Boomer Mystery Series. And um, <clears throat> the characters that are in every one of the books, there are 10 out already. The book 11 will be out next year. There is the husband and the wife. 
there is the two dogs, very important, the two dogs. They have two English Cocker Spaniels named Lucy and Ethel. And the wife talks to the dogs all the time. I'm sure there's no one here who has a dog and talks to their dogs. <laughs> then um, there are the wife's three best friends, who have been best friends since high school, grammar school. And they are Mary Alice, who is a real estate agent. She is a widow. And there is Claire, who is the bossy one. And then there is Nancy, who is, who is uh, Carol's best friend. And then there is, um, there is an interesting, I had to put a nun in it because I went to Catholic school. You who went to the Mount, nod in your head. Um, it's not based on a real nun. However, the people in the convent at the Mercy Center still want to know who it's based on. Her name is Sister Rose. I never had a Sister Rose in college or high school. But, and I just made this character up. But the nuns think that they keep guessing. Every time a new book comes out, they each get a copy. They don't get a copy. They share it. And um, they're all trying to guess as to who the nun is in the book. And they don't believe me that it's really a made-up character. <clears throat> then there are the daughter. There's the daughter of Jim and Carol. In the first book, <clears throat> excuse me, she, um, hang on a second. I have to get water. Hang on. <clears throat> Cheers. In the first book, she's living in California, and she comes home and surprises her parents and moves in from a, a failed love affair. <clears throat> and um, so there's a subplot of her coming in and, and meeting up with her, her old boyfriend. And what's going to happen, that goes through the book, too. Then there is a son, Mike, whom you don't really ever meet in the first book. And somebody said to me, is he going to be in the second book? And I said, well, I don't know. He hasn't told me yet. Because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't just, it just happens. It's weird. So these are the primary characters. And then there are assorted people who come and go, some of whom are dead. <clears throat> but not all of them. So the books each start with a, with a murder. Because I believe in getting that out of the way right away. And when I'm writing, <clears throat> There are times that I do not know who the dead person is. And I know that sounds very strange, but the second book called Moving Can Be Murdered, when they're going to sell their house and downsize, I, had, um, I was going back and forth between um, a, a buyer of their house and the real estate agent. And it took me till the middle of the book to figure out which one was the logical person to kill. And then I had to go back and plant the clues so that it would be logical for the reader. And in the third book, which is Marriage Can Be Murdered, which is the destination wedding on Nantucket. Um, I didn't know who it was going to be till way beyond the beginning of the book. And I had to go back. There was a body at the bottom of the staircase in the beginning of the book. And the wonderful cover artist that I have, who's here on Cape Cod, she did a wedding veil coming, cascading down this spiral staircase with the headpiece at the bottom to simulate the body. And we had no idea who it was until about chapter 25. Then it, we figured out who it had to be. So the way I write is um, I come up with a title, and then I write a story to fit the title. And that's what keeps me motivated, and that's what keeps me on target as to what I'm supposed to be writing about. So those are the first three books. Then book four, and you'll love this, my mom friend over there, I decided that the wife had to go back to her high school reunion. Now, this is one thing that I personally dreaded more than death. But I was talked into going, and it was at Mount St. Joseph Academy. Except Mount St. Joseph Academy, which is my high school, and apparently this young lady's as well, is now an assisted living facility. <laughs> this is absolutely, swear to God, true. <laughs> and I went back with my best friend, Judy, and we went undercover because we wanted to get the whole thing. And, we, and they, they thought we were prime meat, you know, to move on in. And they're showing us all the things. And we're saying, oh, God, this used to be the chapel. Oh, my God, this is where we used to have lunch. Anyway, so I had all the background. And then I wrote Claire, uh, Class Reunions Can Be Murdered. And I truly had a great time writing that one. Then the fifth book, which was not exactly a bestseller, was Funerals Can Be Murder. Now, I don't understand why people didn't get into that title for some reason, but 
It's not, it, there's an Irish wake in it. And nobody knows how to throw a wake like the Irish. So there's an Irish wake in this one. And this is about um, the, the murder of a handyman who works for Carol and Jim. And he has a, uh, I would say double, but it's more like a triple life. He's a busy boy. Then the sixth one, this was really fun to write. This was Second Honeymoon's Family Murder. Now by this time, we're spending some time in Florida. And I have a, a cadre of friends in Florida who said to me, well, can't you kill somebody in Florida? And I thought, well, sure, why not? So I remembered a story that my mother told me years ago. Um, she went to her 50th high school reunion and um, her old boyfriend was there, who was not my father, not the person she married. And all of her lady friends were just all at Twitter that Chuck was going to be there and they were going to see her each other after all this time. And so, um, and of course now I'm looking back and I'm thinking, well, I'm a heck of a lot older than she was when she had through this experience. But anyway, she walked in and he walked over to her and he said, oh, Gladys, you know, it's so wonderful to see you again after all these years. Oh, no, he didn't, excuse me, that's wrong. He called her Jackie. My mother's name was Gladys. He called her Jackie. Why? I don't know. And he said, there's somebody I want you to meet. And he walks over toward this very attractive younger woman. And my mother's thinking, oh yeah, trophy wife. You know, number two, trophy wife. And he said, I would like you to meet my daughter, Jackie. And my mother almost fainted because he had named his daughter after his girlfriend, his first girlfriend. And I thought that was so interesting. And I wondered how his wife felt. Because I don't know how I would feel if my husband, Joe, named somebody after his girlfriend, who was Shirley. So, you know, that was sort of the, the crooks of this plot when they go to Florida. And um, several nefarious things happen. Then, of course, when the wife goes to Florida, she gains weight. Because, hey, you know, it's life. So, we had to go on a diet. <laughs> this is dieting can be murder. But Carol doesn't like to do things the normal way. So rather than um, do a normal thing like join Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or any of those things, she goes online and she, um, she researches diets. And these are honest to God true diets that I found about six years ago when I was researching this book. One was called the Lip, Lip Gloss Diet. There is a brand of lip gloss, and I do not know what it is, that you can buy, supposedly, and put it on your lips. And it dulls your taste buds so that you don't taste and so you don't want to eat as much. Is that ridiculous? It's true. There's another one called the Sleeping Beauty Diet, where you take a pill and you're unconscious for a couple of weeks and you wake up and you've lost a couple of pounds. I, this is not, see, people think I make this up. I found it on the internet, so you know it's true. And then um, there is the, the Blue Plate Diet. <clears throat> And according to this diet, <clears throat> if, you, if you eat on a blue plate, you eat less because it's not as attractive looking on a blue plate. And Carol doesn't want to buy a whole bunch of new, new plates. So she buys a pair of blue sunglasses and walks around with the blue sunglasses. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I have a good time. More water. Cheers. By the way, if anybody has any questions at all, please interrupt me, because I forget things. I always say I don't need to write it down, and then I not only can't, if I did write it down, I can't find where I put it, so just raise your hands. The next book was, okay, Jenny, the daughter, and her husband have had a baby. Big time baby, in-laws. In-laws are coming. It's only the son's mother, who he has not seen in about 15 years. And she shows up the nerve of her, the actual day of the birth, and grabs the baby from Carol's arms. Well, Carol is pretty pissed, let me tell you right now. So this book is what happens when the mother-in-law moves in with Carol and Jim, temporarily. And oh, was this a fun one to write, because I, I love my, my son's in-laws. They're wonderful people but I created this real monster of an in-law, mother-in-law, and it was one of the most fun things I've done. And um, she doesn't die, but um, she suspected a murder, though. 
I made her suffer a little bit. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And I named her after someone who had a hell of a mother-in-law. That was her first name, and I told her it was named after her in her honor. And she was very grateful. <laughs> so then what did we do? Oh, then we did <clears throat> politics can be murder. OK. My timing for this could not have been worse. The publisher and I decided that we would time it for the presidential election in 2018. Just take a gun and kill me now. You know, we could have been worse. So, Carol gets involved in a local election, and somehow or other she's running the campaign, even though she has no clue what she's doing. And of course, there's a death. And, um, and you know, meanwhile, while Carol is doing all these other things, she's also solving a mystery here, kids. And she's a very busy girl. But because her daughter, Jenny, has married a police detective, she's, she's getting a little help. But he's getting a little tired of her walking in with a box of donuts and saying, can we talk for a minute? So that was the ninth book. And then came the Christmas book last year that came out, Mistletoe. And in this one, I brought the mother-in-law back because it was the baby's first Christmas. And Carol and Jim wanted to make it the absolute perfect Christmas. And the uh, furnace breaks. And they have to move out of the, into a hotel. And then the mother-in-law shows up. And so they're all together for Christmas, and it doesn't work out the way that they had planned. So that was, that was the, uh, the book that came out last year. And now, this year, I... <clears throat> this is interesting. During COVID, my publisher called me and he said, I would like you to write a short story. You can, you can use any characters you want. I said, well, I only have one set of characters. I'm not using anybody else. He said, we're doing an anthology, which is basically a collection of short stories. And it is going to have a theme. And they're all mystery writers from all over that are going to be part of this anthology. And the theme is time, it has to be a number. The theme of each, each story has to be a number. It can be a date, it can be a, um, a, a license plate, it can be a street address, it can be a telephone number, it can be anything that you want it to be, but it has to have a number in it. And I said, <clears throat> well, I don't know if I, I can really do this. I'm in the middle of writing Christmas. He said, well, I think you'd, you'd be great at it. You had a great time. And he talked me into it, and then just before he terminated the call, he said, you have two weeks to do it. <laughs> and I thought, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I, all of a sudden I had this idea that really, and it sort of took over my brain. Um, when we lived in Fairfield, we lived in an old house that was built in 1797. And I always believed that we had a ghost in the house. Um, I named her Eunice. Because does every, everybody knows who Aaron Burr was, right? Eunice Denny Burr was his aunt. And she died in our house. She lived in Fairfield, and there's a huge mansion on, on an old post road called the Burr Mansion. And in 1779, the British invaded Fairfield, and it burned it to, they burned it to the ground. This is all historic fact. And I always felt that since Eunice died in my house, she never left. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be interesting if, I, if there was really a ghost in this house? And I had had some inklings when I was living there that there was someone else there. My husband, of course, thought it was nonsense. But even the dogs in the morning, when they would get up and it was still dark outside, all of a sudden they would stand at the kitchen door and they would both just not even move. And it was like they saw something that, that no human would see. And it was a little spooky, to tell you the truth. But the thing that used to really get me was, we used to go to a lot of events in New York because we were both working in New York at that time. And I had a couple of really jazzy dresses that I would drag out, you know, for the occasion. And whenever I would go in for one of the dresses, it was gone. I could never find it. And I had one very favorite black slip that I really loved. It was just the right length. And I could not find that slip for five years. And I would look here, when I was here at the Cape, and I would think, it must be in Fairfield. I go back to Fairfield, it wasn't there. This is the God's truth. The day we moved out of that house, the black slip was in my drawer, all neatly folded up. Now, why don't you figure that one out? 
So I decided to write a story with a ghost in it. And it was 10,000 words, and it was so much fun, honest to God, because with a ghost, you can do anything, and nobody's going to say, oh, that would never happen, because it's a ghost. So then the book didn't come out for two years because of COVID. This is the first copy I've had in my hands. I finally got the box of books right before I was coming down, two days ago. This, and so my story is in here. It's called Masquerades Can Be Murder. And I started to think for the next book, I wanted to find out what happened next. Because the story sort of ends, but there was a lot to be told now between the ghost. What if the ghost didn't leave? What if she stayed in the house? Would Carol see her? Would she and Carol become friends? Would the dog see her? Would Jim see her? So I took a year, um, over a year, to write Masquerades Can Be Murder, and that's the book that's going to be coming out in February of 2024. So I have a sneak peek of it here now. Um, I haven't talked about this book in any other group, so this is like a big deal. Um, and I had a lot of fun with it, and um, it's not really over yet, because I sort of think she's going to come back in another book. But again, it, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting when you write about a ghost, she got very bossy. She began to take over the book a little bit more than I expected her to. But it was, it was a fun book to write, and it'll be out in February. So those are my basic things to talk about. I have many others I could talk about, but um, I wonder if anybody has any questions that I would, could answer for you. Like, why am I standing here? Yes? Do you recommend your books in order? Good. Excellent question. The question was, do I recommend reading the books in order? <clears throat> you don't have to read the books in order. <clears throat> a lot of people really want to read a series, especially a long one, starting with book one, which is Retirement Can Be Murder. Now, this book is out of print. It is available on Amazon in Kindle. And everybody's going, oh, Kindle. Um, the publisher did do Retirement Can Be Murder and Moving Can Be Murder in one book. So this is, I brought a few of these today too. <clears throat> I have a group of readers who read, they're called beta readers, and most mystery writers have them. And they read for not the kind of book reading that you would read for for pleasure, but they read for um, inconsistencies. Not just typos, that's a line reader. They read for this does not make sense. This does not belong here. Basically, they rip the book shreds, is what they do, and make it into a better book. And they always have one person read the book. Now, this is, um, this is book 11 now that I wrote, who has never read any of the books before, to answer that very question. Do I have enough of what is called backstory in the book that gives a, a, a reader who has never read it before backward information on each of the characters? but not so much that it bores somebody who's read all the other books. So the share answer is you really don't have to read them in order. Um, but if you prefer to do it that way, there are ways that you can do it. Okay? So some people are just drawn to a title. Oh, it's Christmas. I want to get a Christmas mystery. You know, whatever. Anybody else? Yes? What's the name of the anthology again? It's called, wait, wait. Infinity. Infinity. <clears throat> and my story is number three in it. And they're all different. Some of them are really scary. And I guess I'm the comic relief in the middle of the book. So did you work a year into the story? Yes, yes. I made up, well, there was a battle of Fairfield. So I made it the Battle of Fairport, which is the name of my Connecticut town. And I made it on July 7, 1779. So everything in the book. That way, it's completely accurate. And then everything else is a lie. <laughs> yeah? Do you have deadlines for yourself for each book? Do you say, <laughs> I'm going to finish this book, you know, or target date? It doesn't have to be a deadline. But... Well, <clears throat> I usually have a new book out every year. Um, and, and I get, you know, aggravation from peers, readers all over the country who say, well, where's the next book, you know? Um, my publisher loves to see a new book every year. 
but after COVID, we're not, they're not publishing them as quickly as they can because it's such a backlog still. Um, I try to write every morning because I, I get easily distracted. And then I go shopping. And that's, listen, this is research, because when I go shopping, I eavesdrop on people's conversations. And this is how I get some of my best ideas yet. So if you see me in Stop and Shop, walk away. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. I work on a computer. Um, and my phone is where I now take notes when I have a particularly brilliant idea at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I used to use, back in the old days, a yellow sticky, and then I couldn't read what I wrote, so that wasn't doing me any good. But yes, I do try to write in the morning. Um, I'm now into the rewrites of, of the um, book that's coming out next year and incorporating the, the suggestions of the beta readers. And um, that is such a helpful exercise for me. And then it will go to, my publisher is Suspense Publishing in California, and then it will go to their editors, and God knows what will happen then. And then I have to rewrite it again. And then, um, and then by, hopefully by February. Oh, and then we have to do the cover. Oh, the cover is the most important thing of all. The cover always has the murder weapon on it. Or a suggestion that you should be able to figure out the answer to the murder when you look at the cover. But you will not probably be able to do it until you read the book. Which is, of course, why I want you to buy the book. Um, the cover artist that I've had is Elizabeth Moyes, and she's the best. But she gets so angry at me because she can't start anything until I finish the book. Because I don't always know how it's going to end. And it's just very frustrating for her. So now we're in crunch time for the cover. So that's the next thing now. So does that answer your question? Yes? Which one of the books was the best-selling book? Oh, this one. This one was number one on Amazon for a, a, a couple of months. Retirement can be murder. There are more women that identify with this title, believe me. Um, I've had women, I'll tell you a few of my funny stories. I did a book event in front of the Yellow Umbrella Bookshop in Chatham. And there had been a story about me in the, the weekly paper up there. And a woman came running up to me and she said to me, oh my God, I could, because I was talking about husbands who rearrange kitchens and rearrange spices and rearrange that stuff. She said, I couldn't wait to meet you and tell you my husband reorganized my purse. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, oh my God, you're kidding. I thought she was kidding me. She said, no, she said, I can't. And then I got into the supermarket and couldn't find anything. So I told that story. Um, there were a group of, of uh, authors doing a group event, and one of them was a man. And he said to me, that would never happen. No, because I always say, don't touch the purse. That would never happen. And by God, the same woman, this is five years later, six years later, came up to me, she said to me, you don't remember me, but, and I said, you're the purse lady. And I said, see, she does exist. And he had to apologize. <laughs> so I do love to, um, to eavesdrop. Once I was in the Marshall's shoe department, and it was a woman on one of those Bluetooths, and I got so interested in the story <laughs> that, and then I thought, that's rude. Well, another woman raised her hand. She said, I've been in that department, and I sometimes just follow them around because I want to find out what happens. Because people talk about anything in a public place. And it's a little annoying if you can't hear the other side of the conversation. But, I mean, really, there's no privacy these days. Yes? What was the name of the mother-in-law? Um, In-laws. 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 Yes. She was a busy girl, too. There was another hand around here somewhere. I thought, hand, yes. Start. Start. Um, what kind of book would you like to write? It's actually not me. It's oh. Everybody thinks it's very hard to start to write a book. Everybody's got thoughts. Everybody's got stories to tell. Um, is it a fiction book or is it a memoir? Do you know what kind of a book it is? Oh, historical fiction. Well, in that case, you have some facts to begin with, to start with. Um, is it about anything on Cape Cod? Is it, has she confided anything in you? Well, there are online book 
groups where you can go on and you can, you can have a, a, a collection of women and men who will critique things and they'll share documents and stuff. Very, very helpful for somebody who's just starting out. So I would advise her to go on and to just look for, for some, uh, and there's wonderful uh, book um, author stock places going on around here where in libraries where you can join a book um, a book group and they will and they every week you have to you have to provide them with a certain number of words and then you go in and you read it and then your other people read it and then you critique each other's work and so it's like a little click of helping each other so that would be what I would suggest if she's is she a Cape person does she live on the Cape do she live on well they're they're all over the place in libraries too so but starting is the worst part actually ending is the worst part I always get confused at the end I got so many things I got to wrap up. Any other questions? Yes. Whoop. Where? Oh, yes. What, I don't think you mentioned it. What did you do before you started writing this book? Oh, <laughs> I got to stop doing that. Um, I was a, let's see, uh, when I graduated from St. Joseph College, um, I moved to uh, New York, and I got a job with a newspaper reporter. This was the 1960s now. His name was Victor Rizel. And Victor was the uh, labor columnist who was blinded by acid in the 1950s outside of Lindy's restaurant. I don't know if, you ever, if you, any of you remember that or not, but it was <clears throat> a seminal moment. And um, I worked for him for a year. I got to have more water, kids. Sorry. <clears throat> ah, sorry. I worked for him for a year. <clears throat> and then I went to work for <clears throat> That didn't do any good, did it? Cosmopolitan magazine. <clears throat> I'm going to get a cough drop. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> God bless CBS. <clears throat> I worked for Cosmopolitan for a while. And then I did freelance writing and editing and um, for a lot of newspapers and magazines. And, um, and then I went to work for Carnegie Hall, where I ran the volunteer program and did special events for the Centennial. And that was a lot of fun. And then I went to work for the Arts Council in New Jersey. And then what did I do? Oh, then I had breast cancer. I was busy. <laughs> and then I started writing. So. That's what I do. <clears throat> Anybody else? No questions? Well, oh, good. Thank you very much. Ah. Centerpieces, which will be up here.